Irving. I'm Billy D. Williams. Tonight, part three of our four-part series, Brown Sugar. A look at America's black female entertainers, women sometimes known in the black community as dark divas. Part one of our series looked at the stars of the 20s, Bessie Smith and Josephine Baker. In our last episode, we saw Ethel Waters, Billie Holiday, and Marian Anderson, all stars of the 1930s. Tonight, we'll look at women in two decades, the 1940s, when such stars as Lena Horne, Hazel Scott, and Catherine Dunham became national social symbols. And the Eisenhower years, when black stars such as Eartha Kitt, Joyce Bryant, and Dorothy Dandridge were openly hailed as sex symbols. And now, part three of the story of a group of amazing women, Brown Sugar, the 1940s through the 1950s. It was a new day as the divas saw the 40s open with a roar. But that roar did not come from the stages of the clubs of America. From the moment the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor in 1941, war was the topic that dominated the thoughts, movements, and hopes of America as a call rang out for patriotism and national unity. War! During this period, the divas, like everyone else, also witnessed a great awakening within black America. There were now a series of national protests, demonstrations, and arguments, many of which were directed at the military, still segregated and openly discriminatory. This famous division with all Negro enlisted personnel was organized 27 years ago. But honestly, folks, they haven't been marching all that time. Racial conflicts also shot up in the early 1940s. Before the decade ended, new black political leaders came to the fore. What with the social and political changes of the era, Americans were bent on showing off their country as the land of the free and the home of the brave. The nation fantasized that its black stars were part of that ideal too. And so in the 1940s, there arose the bourgeois crossover goddess, who was also a social symbol. A woman who could easily fit into the dominant culture when it was convenient. Regardless, all anyone knew or cared about was that the black beauties who came to prominence during the war years were the right dreams at the right time. And none was dreamier or more right than Lena Horne. Someday he'll come along. was the glamorous Lena of the 40s. But when she started out, there was another far different Lena. A plump, bashful kid from Brooklyn named Lena Calhoun Horn. We'll work hard together while we're dreaming. Our plans have meaning. I had a usual, unusual childhood. I was born into a middle class, a very learned black family. But I was taken away from them because of mm, the dislike of my mother and father when they divorced each other. And I was sent to live with strangers when I was five years old. So from then until I was 14 and a half, I had to be a good little girl so I wouldn't get kicked out. Her career began in 1933, when at the age of 16, she was a chorus girl at the Cotton Club in New York City. Later, she was the girl singer with Noble Sissel's Orchestra. Afterwards, she called herself Helena Horn for a while and performed on her own, hopping from one club to another. Soon, she was developing into a true stylist. Oh, when my payday comes around, I call my money on my own.
you say. Say, I don't want no child. Now, I don't want you, baby. It's you the last man alive. The early 1940s saw a transformation in Lena Horn. She was signed by MGM, the most powerful of movie studios. Right away, civil rights groups took a keen interest in her budding movie career, believing she could do much to alter the image of black women in Hollywood films. Facey told me after I had been there for three miserable months, you've got to stay because they don't choose us, and you've been chosen, and whether you like it or not, you've got to go and be... Maybe they'll do something with you in the movies. Okay. Uh, so I go to MGM that day, and sure enough, all the big, big wigs are sitting around, and I spent the next five hours singing, being taken from office to office. In time, Lena Horn became the first black woman in films to be fully glamorized. Okay. Come on in, honey. Fellas, here's Lena Horn. about us telling everybody about consequences. Okay. Life's full of consequences. But who's scared of consequences? Let's sip the honey while it's sweet. We could be messing round, but you is digressing round while I'm tossing nature at your feet. First one I didn't know that was really given a star treatment in, in terms of having special design gowns, uh, eating in the stars part of the commissary, and and really associating with the upper echelons of the studio. capital did not turn her into a housekeeper in pictures. Most of her films were case studies in duplicity. Usually she didn't play a character. She simply came on screen as herself. She wasn't given any kind of roles in the films except uh, musical things that could be deleted if it was sent down south. During the war years, she became the ideal sepia wartime pinup girl. The perfect dream for a soldier's long nights in faraway places. You know, fellas, we here on Jubilee use a language that might sound off the cuff to some of you. When we dedicate a number to, say, a sad sack jack from Fond du Lac, a latchstone jack and a khaki sack, woo! <laughs> we say it that way because, well, I guess because we feel it's a little more personal. We send our hellos and our songs and our laughter, yes, and our hearts, clear around the world to you wherever you happen to be. Then we say to ourselves, we know by your letters that in your spare time, lots of those same fellas hear our jokes and our music. 
She represented the sweet girl back home. But she was far more than that when she toured the army camps. She was shocked to find segregated audiences and courageously spoke out, winning herself a few friends. A real career problem started around that time and intensified after her 1947 marriage to white musical arranger composer Lenny Hayton. Fearful of public opinion, they kept the marriage a secret for three years, yet the marriage endured. Later during the communist witch hunt period, she found herself listed in red channels, a publication listing entertainers said to be either communists or communist sympathizers. Lena Horne was then blacklisted from radio and TV work. We have someone returning to the field. A phonograph recording has been away for quite a while. One of the most dynamic, fresh, charming personalities in, in music. Miss Lena Horn. Love me or leave me or let me be lonely. You won't believe me, but I love you only. I'd rather be lonely than happy with somebody else. By the late 1940s, her Hollywood heyday had drawn to a close. Lena returned full force to the nightclub circuit. Now, though, her style made her seem withdrawn, detached, and cold. I want no one unless that someone is you. I intend to be independently you. I was very icy for many years, really. And I could not be at ease with you or many people. Uh, but um, because of the ice, uh, society had just put around my heart. And I realized I was nice. I was very, very fragile, very human. And, uh, and a woman who had been this way for protection. And uh, so I let... I, I loved it well, that she made me cry because I wouldn't cry for years. Despite her problems, Lena Horne never stopped performing. And later on Broadway, she re-emerged in shining triumph. Another diva social symbol during the 1940s was jazz pianist Hazel Scott. When you're down and out, lift up your head and shout, there's gonna be a great day. Angels in the sky, promise to by and by, there's gonna be a great day. Angels in the sky, promise to by and by, there's gonna be a great day. Angels in the sky, promise to by and by, there's gonna be a great day. Gabriel the one, so early born, you'll hear his horn. It's not far away, hold up your hands and say, there's gonna be a great day. She was a prime example of a talented black woman who made it into the system. Firmly rooted in the world of the black bourgeoisie, Scott's background was unlike that of most other divas. She had been born in Trinidad in 1920 and was a child prodigy, having mastered the piano by age four. That same year, her mother brought her to the States. By age 20, Scott's career had taken off when she opened at Barney Josephson's Cafe Society. I auditioned her. And I leveled with her. I said, I've got Ida Cox coming in. I can only offer you a job for one week. I can't promise you more now. If you want to do that, you may. Well, she said, that's all right with me. So Hazel came in, played the piano, sang a few songs. But of course, her, her best thing was her piano. 
And uh, Ida Cox came the following week, and I kept uh, Hazel on. I had Hazel and Ida, and Ida finished her engagement and left, and Hazel stayed on for seven and a half years. She came in for one week. Hazel Scott's specialty was giving a new bent to classical music. Hazel knew the classics, and she would play them, and she would say, I'm going to play Rachmaninoff's and something, you know, uh, and whatever, the G, number, letter, or what, the way it was written, and then the way I like it. And when she'd start jazzing <laughs> with the, these classics, people went wild. Also went to Hollywood, but there were no made roles for her. When the ivory is and the jivey keep that booty bar awake, make them music. I had written in the contract that Hazel Scott could not be shown in any way that would be uh, a reflection upon her race. No bandana on her head, no apron around her waist. And they did it. They took her. They wanted her that much. They took her. She always appeared as herself in a nightclub segment of the picture. Of course, most of her scenes could easily be cut should it be thought they would offend certain audiences. Regardless, she was a blazing symbol of the new contemporary black woman. Completely at home in the most continental of settings. But her motion picture career proved to be a mixed blessing. At first it was great. I was sort of like a little spoiled darling on the Columbia lot. But it was the next year that we ran into difficulty. She clashed with studio boss Harry Cohen while filming a World War II musical in which blacks were portrayed as stereotypes. In retrospect, she said many people told her that if she had been a little bit more calm, she probably would have won Harry Cohen over and he would have said, what an absurd idea, yes, let's change the customs. But instead, she was very upset, and um, at the end he said, this is the last movie you'll ever make. And there's an interesting uh, footnote to that. I was already signed for the Gershwin story, Rhapsody in Blue, so I, I made that. And then he, he was as good as his word. I never made another Hollywood film to this day. Black politician Adam Clayton Powell Jr. married Hazel Scott in 1945. Their marriage received a great deal of attention. Scott continued performing, and for years she went from one dazzling concert performance to another. The two had a son and were thought of as the modern Negro couple, educated, well-traveled, attractive go-getters and doers. Attention followed Hazel everywhere. During a tour in Washington State, she was refused service in a restaurant. She sued and won. We're sitting at this counter, and this dear little young woman comes over to us. She said, yes. And Eunice said, I'll have this, and I'll have it. She said, I'm very sorry we can't serve you. And I sat there. I couldn't believe this. And if you get any further north, you'll be in Canada, Eunice. This is the state of Washington. And I said, come on, we're going to find a police station. And around the corner and up the street we went where I looked into a pair of the coldest green eyes I've ever seen in my life. And when I told what had happened, he said, are you going to get out of here or am I going to run you in for disturbing the peace? She won the suit. The restaurant went out of business. There's just story after story like this. It just goes on and on. 
Politically outspoken, Hazel Scott, like Lena Horne, was listed in red channels. Eventually, she was called before Senator Joseph McCarthy's Committee on Un-American Activities. She said, I'm going to go before that committee, and I will tell them exactly what I think of them. Said, the most un-American thing in America is the House Un-American Activities Committee. This fight to expose those who would destroy this nation will go on and on. To make a long story short, her testimony did not sit well with the committee, and uh, her television show was canceled. Her career was never the same. I'd like to sing a song for you in French. This is a lovely tune by Harvey and Cosma, and it's known in America as Autumn Leaves, and in Europe as Les Feuilles Mortes. In the late 1950s, Hazel Scott went to Europe. She later divorced Powell. <laughs> Hazel Scott did not actively return to the New York nightclub circuit until the 1970s. She died in 1981. The war years also marked the rise of the brilliant choreographer-dancer Catherine Dunham, who almost single-handedly made the critics take the world of black dance seriously. Dunham was so popular that she took her hot style to Hollywood. She also toured widely with the company she had formed and was always outspoken. Dunham announced at the conclusion of a performance at which the audience was segregated, this is the last time I shall play Louisville because the management refuses to let people like us sit by people like you. Along with Lena Horn and Hazel Scott, Catherine Dunham ushered in a new idea that the Negro entertainer indeed could play a special social or political role. In contrast, there were new stars whose mellow styles entertain audiences for years to come. around here tonight because Dakota State is making her TV debut with us. And uh, you may be interested to know that Dakota means friend, and when you hear Miss State sing, you'll know what we mean. Oh, sing, friend. Columbus when they said the world was round. They all back to an Edison recorded sound. They 
all laughed at Wilbur and his brother when they said the man could fly. They stood on Maconey while this was so phony. It's the same old guy. They laughed at me once Said I was reaching for the moon. But oh, you came soon. Now they'll have to change it too. They all said we never could be happy. They laughed at us and how. But ha, 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 who's got the last laugh at all? And this time there were high spirits too, like Sister Rosetta Thorpe. gave way to the fabulous 50s, the Eisenhower era. America's divas once again were affected by a national mood, one brimming with disparities and novelties. Television, new fads and trends, as well as the Cold War and the Korean conflict. One of the world's most unique movie houses has always been the Apollo Theater on 125th Street in New York City. The show is already in progress. As usual, the bill features two of the swingin' stars of the day. Dinah Washington, who started out as a vocalist of Lionel Hampton's band, and the former Chick Webb saxophone player, Louis Jordan. In the 50s, the new diva often seemed anxious to shake things up. That included even a mild-mannered star like Dinah Washington. What a difference a day next. stage, Dinah Washington was as comforting as they come. Off stage, difficult and demanding. She went through eight husbands, called herself the queen, and in 1963, died of an overdose of pills at age 39. What a difference. There's a big rainbow before me. Other divas used other methods to get attention. In the beginning with Pearl Bailey, it was humor and pure, undiluted energy. Tonight we in the group together. Ain't gonna worry about stormy weather. Gonna kick old trouble out the door. Eventually, like Dinah Washington, Bailey also shot. Her controversial marriage to white drummer Louis Belson put her in the headlines. Equally unsettling, as our divas discovered, was the national fascination with the sexually free woman. A fascination which, curiously enough, enabled the diva to emerge, for better or worse, for the first time as an authentic above-ground sex goddess. Openly worshipped and adored. 
Nowhere was that more evident than with the appearance of a tiny terror of a star, sometimes called the Catwoman. A goddess who scratched, purred, and growled and snarled away to the very top. For so many in the mid-1950s, Eartha Kitt represented the ultimate tan temptress, who seemed to make fun of her audiences, staring them down with her hypnotic glance. Here stood a sexy high priestess of personality. Her personal story was of interest. She had been born poor in South Carolina. While still young, she was sent to live in New York City. Her career began with the Catherine Dunham Dance Troupe, a company she'd long fantasized about. But I said, I don't care. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to join the Catherine Dunham Company, and I'm going to go around the world, and I was making the whole thing up. Not even thinking about it. So here was the situation. I came out of the cinema on the street. The girl walks up to me, and she said, can you tell me the directions to this makeup shop? I'm a Catherine Dunham dancer. And Miss Dunham has sent me out to buy this makeup and clicked in my head. I was just talking about Catherine Dunham the day before. I would like to meet her, I said. Oh, she said Miss Dunham is giving you auditions mm -hmm. this afternoon. You tell me where the makeup shop is and I will take you down to meet Miss Dunham. When I got to the school, they were having auditions. I was dared to join the class and then somebody else in the school said, Oh, I dare you too, blah, 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 blah. Somebody threw me a rehearsal garment. I went into the little girl's room and changed my clothes, and I went back and joined the class and won a full scholarship. That's how I got into show business. Later, while abroad, she left the troupe for a nightclub career. Europeans went wild over Eartha. Upon returning to the stage, she made a series of sexy hit records. At first, the record companies had thought her voice too weird and had rejected her. Well, even though they rejected me in the beginning, Five gold albums later, they literally, physically came to pick me up from my apartment here in Manhattan mm -hmm. in a Rolls Royce car, dawned with roses, and when I got to the studio, they physically rolled out the red carpet from the studio to my car, lined with red roses, and when I got upstairs to the studio, the 34 or 64 piece of an orchestra, there was Dom Perignon champagne and roses for everybody. From there, Eartha went on to do almost everything. Movies, nightclubs, and finally television. I've got to be free. Please, let me go. I've got to be free. I've got to be free. You are free to go, Danny. Oh, oh I have to give you credit, Catwoman. I expected this place to be a shambles because of a fight. <laughs> As it may yet be, Joker. So, Batman, you found us. As you perhaps planned, Catwoman. The mere thought of pulling a caper without your masked meddling would be most perturbing to me. Founders you have, and get you, we will. Get them, boys! I wanna be wicked. Orson Welles proclaimed her the most exciting woman in the world. Orson believed that, no doubt, Eartha did too. Kit adored the attention. The public was what accepted me. So that public became the family that I suppose I've always wanted. Outside of my child now that I have... have gone through that feeling. But it's a beautiful feeling. There's nothing in the world like having the public love you. Controversy was to follow Kit in later years. In 1968, at a White House luncheon with Lady Bird Johnson, Kit criticized the president's policy in Vietnam. Afterwards, Kit said an angered President Johnson had the CIA gather a dossier on her. So they know, they think that you're trouble. Can you imagine a hotel in Las Vegas or Atlantic City having the CIA on their doorsteps every time you appear there so you're not asked to come there to work? No problem. So you gradually put out of work. And on the dossier, it says that President Johnson picked up the phone 
and called the networks across the nation and said, I do not want to see that woman on the air. Kit's early problems simply set the stage for the troubled divas of the 1950s who followed. I don't want to have things wrong with me anymore. I don't want to be sick anymore. I don't want you anymore. I have a youngster here from San Francisco, and I'm quite sure you're going to enjoy her voice. Her name is Joyce Bryant. She's got an awful lot on the ball. You all ready? Here is Joyce Bryant. Let's have an idea. Here was another 50s singer to emerge as a sex symbol, and also to have her share of difficulties. I can't give you anything but love. struggled for years to make it as a performer, but did not really arrive until she came up with a surefire gimmick. A gimmick that came about when Bryant found herself appearing on the same bill with Josephine Baker. I knew that I was going to do a performance with this woman in California. And uh, I had heard so much about her, and she was, and it's true, she just ripped the audience inside out without out having opened her mouth. So what was she going to do if she performed? And what was I going to do, being on stage with her? So I came up with the idea to paint my hair. And I coated my hair with lanolin. And I used radiator paint and painted my hair um, silver. And the, it was an extraordinary impact. Drunk with love, my body stings. There I was, and the audience just went berserk. And, um, uh, and Josephine said to me, to share, <laughs> because she knew. Often called the black Marilyn Monroe, Joyce Bryant exuded sex. So provocative were her renditions of love for sale and drunk with love that both had been banned from the airwaves in some cities brian played big clubs even in miami then still rigidly segregated she remembers the racial incidents that took place against hotel manager dave levinson the hotel was called the algiers hotel at that time and um so from what i understand before i arrived they burned across, the KKK burned across on his lawn, I believe, and also the hotel. But eventually, the sex goddess image unnerved Brian. I couldn't deal with my own sexuality. My, I, I, I didn't understand, and I think that had to do with my background. And uh, I would go out and sing, but that was that. And when I came back, there was something else. And I'm two different people. I am definitely two different people from the person who stands on the stage and performs and the one for this matter sitting and talking to you. She also had drug problems. It's true. During those days, you have to take sleeping pills. I had needed to take sleeping pills to go to sleep and I guess um, up, down is to go to bed and up is to wake up or what have you. Tense, anxious, Joyce Bryant eventually left show business for religion. That was nothing as far as these people were concerned. You know, I was a pound of flesh. And I was a money-making um, something, nothing. And um, I knew that these people did not care about me, that I'd have to, I'd have to run because I was afraid for myself. And I realized that I was having a lot of problems. Joyce Bryant stayed away from show business for years, only to return successfully in the 1970s. She exemplified the troubled diva whose personal conflicts grasp hold of the mass imagination. 
But in no other diva were the disparities and contradictions of the period more tragically summed up than in the golden girl of the age, Dorothy Dandy. So take your cue, boy. Don't say I didn't tell. Dorothy Dandridge became America's first bona fide black movie star and black America's most cherished cultural icon in this era. She was a child of Hollywood, having grown up with her older sister Vivian in a heady showbiz atmosphere. Their mother, comedian Ruby Dandridge, worked in films and radio shows. While still young children, the sisters entered show business. We didn't play that much because, you see, we were into acrobatics and... I rehearsed piano two hours a day. We rehearsed acrobatics at least an hour a day. Then we went dancing. We had to rehearse that. And then Dottie would have to stay uh, up on her readings. So it was really work. We weren't permitted to play with other children at that time. We didn't have the time. We were called the Wonder Children. <laughs> As teenagers, the girls teamed up with Etta Jones to form the Dandridge system. Even at this time, Dorothy Dandridge stood out. If it hadn't been for mom and pa, I don't know where I'd be. Every night I'd like my stars that I was born their king. I know that you'll agree with me when I tell you what they did. They made me swing for my supper. A versatile Dorothy also performed with the Nicholas Brothers, one of whom, Harold, she was to marry later. Oh, pardon me, boy. Yes, yes. Is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? That's the Chattanooga Choo Choo. Track 29. 29. That's on the Tennessee line. She said the Tennessee line. Jack, she means that she can't afford. I can't afford to go to Chattanooga. You should have to get in there. I'll die myself. You say you have? Uh-huh, but not a nickel to say. Well, I do. Who would it have? You leave the Pennsylvania station by the corner. Read a magazine and then you end Baltimore. Dinner and the diner. Nothing could be finer than to have your hand and make the Carolina. with Harold and Harold was very much in love with Dorothy and just a very happy situation and they were married shortly after that and they had a daughter whom they named Harold and uh, Dorothy said years later the first few years were the happiest period of her life. During this period Dandridge had a great emotional setback when she discovered her daughter was born brain damaged. She didn't want to believe this child was retarded. It was something she just never really wanted to accept. You see, she blamed herself in a way because of the child's condition. Her daughter and the eventual failure of her marriage sent Dandridge into a bout of depression. Well, she failed. She failed as a wife, the way she loved to cook and be at home and things, and she felt like she failed as a mother. Despite her personal trauma, an extraordinary drive took over. Yes, 
introverted and a very private woman in a very public profession she pushed herself even beyond her limits on my plane down near Santa Fe I met a cowboy riding the range one day and as he jogged along I heard him singing the most peculiar cowboy song it was a day he he learned in the city a summertime push eventually paid off. She got to play the big nightclubs. At some of her engagements, though, her tension showed. Historically, at this time, uh, black were primarily invisible as far as the media was concerned. So this was a, another responsibility she felt because if uh, she failed in some way, she felt that others could not uh, get employment in these clubs. Dandridge's drive motivated her to set out to capture the most American and most elusive of dreams. Movie star. I'm Dorothy Dandridge. I play the role of Jane Richards, a teacher. Mr. Williams, I know I'm a new teacher, and I haven't had much experience. But this boy, this C.T., well, I know he isn't interested in anything we do or say, but he's my pupil now, and it's up to me to work it out. Ah, uh, Mrs. Richards. Yes. You look tired. I am. Well, there's nothing like a pick-me-up when you're tired. Why don't I walk you down for an ice cream soda? Why don't you? At the beginning of the 50s, the idea that a black woman could become a dramatic leading film actress was still unthought of. But this dream was realized in 1954 when Dorothy Dandridge starred in Carmen Jones. You think what you want. I don't account to no man. You're counting to me. I love you. That gives you the right... That don't give right you no right to own me. There's only one that does. That's me. Myself. Where are you going? I might come back. Life magazine celebrated her triumph. Later, she was nominated for an Oscar as Best Actress of 1954. It was the first time a black woman had ever been nominated for the Oscar in the leading role category. Afterwards, she discovered that everywhere she went, everything she said or did was of public interest. A host of international publications publicized, promoted, and fawned over her. Within a constant world of attention and adulation, she arrived with director Otto Preminger at the Cannes Film Festival, where Carmen Jones had a special screening. For Black America, then about to launch its massive civil rights offensive, Dorothy Dandridge was part of the new day. So while she rode the crest of success, there was, quite simply, no star quite like dream girl Dorothy Dandridge. Sadly, her decline came soon after her heady trial. There were no great follow-up roles. Three years passed before she appeared in another movie. In spite of all the success and raves and the financial success and box office appeal of the movie, uh, none of the producers could find a, a role that they believed they could uh, use her in. Vandridge the returned to television and nightclub work, feeling she had failed as a dramatic actress. 
Her off-screen life was a shambles, too. In 1959, she married white restaurateur Jack Dennison. Like so many other divas before her, Dandridge found herself isolated in a profession that few black men could get anywhere near. Dennison was the next person on what may be called a rebound from one romance. And he spoke in a very charming way. He was very handsome. Yet he had a persuasive uh, style of living. And so they ended up getting married. And she later said this was the biggest mistake of her life. And she ended up in bankruptcy. And this was a disgrace that uh, tore her apart. She never after that was the same person. The two divorced. She did sign a new movie contract. But then, tragedy struck. A manager remembers the morning she died. So I went over to the house and I went up and thought he was lying on the floor as if she were asleep. I put my hand on her shoulder and uh, it's an angel face and uh, she was cold. She had given me a note. She had a premonition that she was going to die. To whomever discovers me after death. Important. In case of my death, to whomever discovers it, don't remove anything I have on. Scarf, gown, underwear. Cremate me right away. If I have anything, money, furniture, give to my mother, Ruby Dandridge. She will know what to do. Dorothy Dandridge. She died of an excess of Tolfanil, a relaxer prescribed by her doctor. I still think that the... Uh, the tragedy uh, in, in what makes it in her life uh, and what makes it even more uh, um, dismal to me is the fact that Dorothy was such a beautiful woman. If I just could live on easy things, I wouldn't want a job today. So please go away. Everything looked just perfect on the surface. But underneath it all is like a beautiful red apple, but you open it up, it's full of worms and things. And it is just like that throughout so much of her life. And I just felt, oh God, if a person ever did uh, happen to want to do away with themselves, this is a kind of case that, where I can really understand that. Dorothy Dandridge, the 50s golden girl, who once said she had everything and nothing dead at the age of 42. Eisenhower era, the 1950s, grew to a close. Gabriel the Wood, so early born, so here is born. It's not far away, hold up your hands and say, there's gonna be a great day. The Divas had made great professional achievements. Not only had they continued their crossover into mainstream culture, the system itself, but they had received a new kind of official recognition. What with the magazine covers, the television appearances, and the big nightclub engagements. Ironically, it was precisely the system that some divas would question in the next decade. The restless 60s. Still the big stars of the 40s and 50s had run hard and fast to make it. Someday he'll come along. Day. He'll look at me and smile. I'll understand. 
now we both Join host Tony Brown as he addresses provocative issues confronting black Americans on Tony Brown's journal every Sunday right here at 5. Shall meet him Sunday.